Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I hope everyone is good and well, and uh, and all is and all is well. Um, let's go ahead and pray, and uh, we will begin our uh, our topic this morning. And uh, let's let's go ahead. All right, Lord, thank you so much for just the opportunity for us to be here and talk about the substance and the nature of man from your perspective. Right. Um, I pray, God, that this would be uh, constructive and productive and uh, that you would be glorified as we look at your word and how we ought to see ourselves in light of what you've revealed to us. Thank you so much. What's in your son's name. Amen. OK, um, so for the past several weeks, uh, um, Will has been uh, dis uh, discussing things that he's had to get off his chest. And so he'd asked me if I had some things that I had to get off my chest. And I said, yeah, I do. Um, as a matter of fact, I left you guys on a cliffhanger a couple of months ago, right? When when uh, when Will and uh, when Will and Sarah went on vacation and I was tasked with the responsibility of coming up with three teachings. And one of those teachings was human personality and the biblical perspective. And we answered about three questions out of five questions and I left you on a cliffhanger, and we've been hanging off of that cliff ever since, all right? Well, now we are going to uh, finish uh, this particular detail. Now, if you think I don't have any more in the chamber regarding this issue, oh, you don't know me. I've got, I've got tons, of, tons of other information, all right? Um, this, is, this, is, this is my love language. I love psychology. Um, I don't think we should be afraid of it. Um, I think we should take it and try to understand it from a biblical perspective. If God has revealed himself and has revealed the substance and nature of human beings, we should be able to trust that, right? And so my goal uh, in this particular uh, teaching, as well as outside of teaching, is to make psychology biblical again. That is it, right? So let's go ahead and talk about what we are going to do and our agenda for this morning. We're going to explore and finish some questions regarding human personality. That's the only goal we have. But before we get to that, we have to do some review. Because even though I know all of you in this room remember what I talked talked about two months ago, okay? We still have to do it for, the, for some of you who may not, okay? Or maybe even those of you on uh, on social media, Facebook and stuff, I know you might remember that. Um, but, uh, you know, it's nevertheless, it's always important to review. Now, when we talk about the word personality, remember the word personality itself, breaking down the English word, comes from the Latin word person, meaning an individual or a human being. Notice the language here. It is talking about those who are of a particular substance, right? Person is the Latin word. The case ending, I-T-Y, whenever you see this word used, it speaks to the nature or the quality of a particular thing, okay? So putting these two words together, Personality can be understood to be the nature or quality of human beings. The question that we're asking with this word, when this word is brought up, is what makes a person a person? Okay? What makes a person a person? What are the component parts or the nature or the disposition of what makes a person a person? Now, if you recall, we looked at a lot of definitions, a lot of descriptions about what this word means. And we came to the conclusion, looking at the American Psychological Association, we looked at uh, uh, online sites, right, uh, such as uh, psychology websites. We even, look, we even went and looked in encyclopedia descriptions and definitions, right? And it turned out that everyone had something different. There was no general consensus as to what personality was. It could be, it could be genetic, it could be environmental, 
It could be both. It could be neither. No one knew. Okay. So then we said, well, why don't we look at what the scripture has to say? Because it seems that everyone else has an observation or an opinion about what personality is. So let's see if we can go to the text and look and find out what personality was. And if you recall, we went to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. We also looked at Genesis 2. So let's go ahead and turn there. And let's read it and make some observations. We'll do, we'll do Genesis 2, even though it's not up on my slides. We'll go ahead and take a look at that also. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. Don't you, don't you, do you see I'm just having fun up here? Oh, my gosh, this hour is going to go by so fast. Oh, I can't stand when that happens. But nevertheless, that's, it is what it is. Chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the earth, and over every crawling thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over every living thing that moves on the earth right or on the land. So we see that uh, humanity, male and female, make up humankind. We see that both humankind, male and female, individually are made, created in the image of God. And because of this, they carry specific duties and responsibilities that God has given them, such as uh, 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 being fruitful and multiplying, filling the earth, ruling over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, things like that, caretaking, God's creation. They were stewards of this, right? We also see in Genesis chapter 2 the, the specific creation of male and female. That in verse 6 and 7 of chapter 2, but a mist used to rise to form the, uh, from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground, verse 7, then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul i had mentioned that god that man was not animated until god breathed into his nostrils and he became alive he became animated a living being right then we looked at the activity of god concerning adam in making eve or woman I'll start at verse 18 of chapter 2. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper corresponding or suitable for him. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. I mentioned it. I mentioned very briefly in the last lecture that we had, this was a purposeful exercise for Adam to not only name the animals, but to observe that none of these creatures looked like him, right? They were different from him, which underscored some of the personality theories we looked at, because a lot of the individuals who endorse personality theory believe that we derived from animals. I just thought I'd throw that out there. Verse 20, the man gave names to all the cattle, all the birds of the sky, and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not a, a helper corresponding to him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man that he slept, took out one of his ribs, closed up the flesh of that place. The Lord God built or fashioned into a woman the, uh, the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. She is the last presentation. And lo and behold, this woman looks just like him wonderful right 
So after looking at all of these details from chapter one and chapter two concerning man, concerning woman, concerning humanity, concerning God, being, uh, concerning humanity being made in the image of God, we came to some conclusions that, the, uh, that with the alternative perspectives about personality, remember when we looked at those other things and looked at all of the influencers of personality theory, they focused on external behaviors, what people saw, right? Attitudes habits or internal responses. However, it would seem based upon Genesis 1, Genesis 2, we could even put Genesis 9 in there as well, okay? It would seem that from the biblical perspective, the form and substance of a human being make up personality, flesh, material, and immaterial, okay? The way that we are made and designed and from the substance by which we are made and designed is what makes up a person, okay? Just by the word itself. In addition, personality assessments and theories seek to describe what makes a person unique from another. I am analytical. You are expressive. I am an INFJ. You are an ENFJ, right? I am unique to you because my attitude or my <laughs> motives or my, uh, my habits are different than yours. However, personality from a biblical perspective seeks to reveal what makes humankind unique from the rest of creation, from the rest of creation. We are not animals. We are not trees, birds, bees, whales, snails. We are not any of those. What makes up the qualities of a person, a person and the substance in which they are designed? We are not e evolved, more evolved creatures. We do, we are not stardust. We are unique from the rest of creation. So then we looked at the unity and the diversity of activities and choices. Well, then how, why is it that we make all these choices? If we are, if we all have the same personality, which is what I, what I argued for, if all of us have the same personality, then why do we have different preferences, different likes? Why do I like the best ice cream in the world and you guys don't, right? Well, remember, the Bible does not inform each human being on the specifics of labor. We talked about this, right? Well, how come if we all have the same personality, why doesn't everybody have the same job, right? Well, no, the Bible doesn't give specifics on what type of labor a person ought to do. Everybody ought to be a garbage collector, right? Instead, the scripture informs the believer of the paradigm or the outlook of how to view labor. We've been talking about this in the book of Ecclesiastes, have we not, right? That there are a variation of all sorts of activities and all sorts of work and all sorts of labor, right? It's not, if you want to become a, an airline pilot, there's no prohibition in the scriptures against that. Now, if you misuse individuals while being an airline pilot, God's concerned about that. Example number two, we talked about physical features. I mentioned that I did, I can't turn to the book of flesh alonians, okay? And look at the chapter and go, Luther Smith needs to find a Hispanic 5'2 uh, woman. 
or a person who is a redhead needs to marry other redheads, thus saith the Lord. No biblical text says that, right? So the Bible does not instruct a person on what physical features a person should consider when they desire to marry another person, right? God makes, uh, um, God makes concessions for preferences that we have. However, the Bible does give human beings the proper perspective as to how to conduct oneself in your marriage. If you marry a person that looks like uh, the elephant man, and you look at them and you go, aren't they so gorgeous? And I'm like, General Omar Bradley, um, they just threw up, their neck just threw up, right? <laughs> If, if, if you find them gorgeous, the Bible makes concessions for that. What you ought to be doing is how to conduct yourself. If you are married, you love your wife. You respect your husband. You train your children, right? Which brings us to the third example. The Bible does not inform a believer on how they ought to establish, who they ought to establish friends with. However, the scripture does inform the, a believer on the qualities they ought to look for when establishing friendships. Look for these things. Are they trustworthy? Are they caring? Will they be able to encourage you and strengthen you in God's word? Are they reliable? Things like that. Ver number four, the Bible does not give sp a specific method or technique for parents to instruct their children. God even makes concessions for this, right? We know that we can be very passive with another child, but then, then we have to be very active with the other one, right? Why do you treat me so differently? Well, if you do what you're told, right? Then I won't have, have to tell you, right? God even gives concessions for this. However, the scripture doesn't instruct parents that they ought to train their children in God's word. We don't get to skip that, right? So notice all of this variation, true diversity within scripture based upon our particular preferences towards things. God understands that we're not all going to have the same interests or a group of us are going to have the same interests, but maybe not do it in the same manner. God is concerned with metadata, not minor. God is concerned about our perspective in this world and how we ought to conduct ourselves rather than what shoes we ought to buy or what type of milk we get so on and so forth or whether or not we are expressive or analytical matter of fact i could make the case that all of us are expressive in some way example five Humanity thinks about personal experiences and, design, and, and assigns value to those experiences based upon one's outlook. This is why I don't care about pictures. But my wife does. You just look at her phone. She has at least about 5 million of them. Okay? <laughs> However, God's word gives humanity wisdom as to how to observe personal experiences from a biblical perspective. Okay. Again, which is uh, why we're going through Ecclesiastes right now in hour one. Proverbs is written for such for such uh, information so that we can look at our activity and our experiences through the lens of God's point of view. Not from our own. In short, God does not give these instructions to animals. He doesn't give these instructions to plants. And since we are a soul, 
God anticipates these differences in the choices and activity of humanity concerning labor, relationships, and activity. I find this to be fascinating. The variation of all of us in this room is an example of what I'm talking about. Because animals don't make the same choices we do. You don't go to your plant and ask them, should I, should I invest in the stock option? You don't do that. God anticipates these differences in the choices and activity of humanity concerning labor and relationships. These were the three questions that, that we answered based upon these observations from Genesis 1 and 2. We didn't even go that far. That why do we have different interests or hobbies if we don't have different personalities? Why do we respond differently to certain situations? Why do we act differently? These are deep dive questions because it depends on many factors. Our observations, our worldview, is why we have different interests, hobbies, why we, why we uh, uh, have certain situations, our personal interests, the effort. I cannot draw because I don't, I don't want to. <laughs> but there are individuals that do draw and invest time and, 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 and develop that skill. Attention, influences, However, once more, this is because we have the ability to think and reason. This comes from how we were made. This underscores our personality or our personhood. The reason why we express ourselves is because we have a soul. The reason why we think is because we are a soul. The reason why we reason is because we are a soul. The reason why we have all these activities is because of the fact that this underscores, this highlights in bright, bold colors that we are unique from the rest of creation. Not that we are unique from each other. So remember, if we looked at this personality, this personality comparison, the difference between personality from a secular humanistic perspective and personality, I'm going to say from a biblical perspective of humanity, is that one personality is built on a micro and macro evolutionary foundation. We talked about that in the last, the last lecture. The next one is uh, in, in biblical perspective of personality, that personality is built on the image of God, the Imago Dei, okay? The second point that I made is that personality from a secular humanistic perspective is built on the assumption, on the assumption that humankind is a more evolved animal and is only material. You and I are only neurotransmitters and synapses, and dopamine, and glutamate, and acetylcholine, and, and heart, and liver, and lungs, and digestive systems, and acidic acid. That's all we are. And when we die, we're buried, and we're done. That's it. We're worm food. But personality from a biblical perspective is built on the reality that humanity has and is a soul. That we are in this body. And that when we die, we will continue to live with all of the effects that we still have. We looked at Luke for that. Number three, personality according to a secular humanistic perspective, is built by external actions or motivations. Whereas personality from a biblical perspective emphasizes the substance and form of human beings. Not to say that actions aren't important, but that's not what personality is from a biblical outlook. 
it, it, personality is who we are, the substance and form of how we're made and what we're made with. In personality for secular humanism, <clears throat> diversity and personality is what makes us human beings. That's not what makes us human beings from a biblical perspective. The reality that we are a soul is what makes us human beings or living beings. In secular humanists and secular humanism, personality distinguishes us from one another. You know, I'm analytical, you're expressive, therefore I'm more smarter than you because I'm more analytical and you're not. You need to learn from me. However, personality from a biblical perspective distinguishes us from plants and animals. It truly equals us out because now we're not comparing ourselves to each other. We're comp we are not comparing at all, actually. We're recognizing that we are unique to everything. In personality and secular humanism, the material is primarily responsible for the diversity of hobbies and the activities of humanity. Hey, just train your brain to do this. Train your brain to do that. Train your brain to go here, go there. You know, things like that. In, in the biblical perspective, the immaterial, if you were to take my soul out of this body, what is it going to do? It's going to fall like Pinocchio without streaks. The immaterial is responsible for the diversity of hobbies and the activities of humanity. And then lastly, in secular humanism, everyone has a different personality. In the biblical perspective, everyone has the same. So we le I left you last time, long review, right? But an important one, because I left you with these last two questions. And this is where we will spend the rest of our time. Is what is a person assessing when they take a personality assessment? If personality assessments don't measure personality from a biblical perspective, what are they measuring? And what is a personality assessment? Measuring, again, if not personality. Let's look at a couple of them. I'm sure we're all familiar with them. Myers-Briggs, MBTI inventory, created by Catherine Briggs and Clarence Myers, her son-in-law, by the way, so this was a tag team, right? Now, how, how did this start? Just boiling down the, the historical story and the account of how the Myers-Briggs came to be. Catherine Briggs, was heavily influenced by Carl Jung. We talked about Carl Jung last lecture, who believed that there were eight personality types, okay? Matter of fact, some say that he was the kind of the father of personality theory, okay? So Catherine Briggs, along with her daughter, Isabel, and Clarence Myers, who basically put it, uh, Isabel kind of put it all together. Clarence Myers and Catherine Briggs had a couple of meetings together, and, and instead, they expanded the personalities from 8 to 16. Now, if you're like me, you would ask the question, why would they do that? What was the point that they did that? You know, I couldn't find the reasoning why they did that. They just said 8 to 16. We'll just divide, but we'll just multiply by 2. There you go, you know? I have no idea why they did that, especially if they were influenced by Carl Jung, who had eight personalities, or at least to find that there were eight. <laughs> then we have the Essenic Personality Questionnaire, or the EPQ. By the way, uh, the Myers-Briggs is used for all types of things, used for employment, used for work, government agencies use them. I mean. It's used for all types, all types of places, okay? The Essenic Personality Questionnaire, or the EPQ, was created by Hans Essenic. Um, he used mathematical statistics to recognize when he was convinced that there were two dimensions of personality, extroversion and neuroticism. So the Myers-Briggs was influenced by Carl Jung, this questionnaire was influenced by mathematical statistics. He was somewhat of a statistician. He later added a third, 
psychoticism. Okay. So this questionnaire was revised and was changed to add three dimensions, extroversion, introversion, neuroticism, and tough-mindedness, and just, and just so that there's no funny business when you take this questionnaire, a lie scale, okay? Because we certainly don't want you to lie on a questionnaire regarding your personality now, okay? It's not, it's not good. Here's a third one, the big five. This one is a bit, this one's a bit complex. Okay, so, so I'm gonna go semi-slow, okay? This was created by two gentlemen, uh, Gordon Alpert and Henry Odbert. Both of them were two psychologists in the 1930s. By the way, this is still being used. And they collected, this is how they did this, over 18,000 words from the dictionary. Okay, so they went to the dictionary, they collected 18,000 words, and they used that as the base for their personality traits. Okay. From these words that they pulled out, so 18,000, they pulled out non physical adjectives. So anger or angry. Uh, 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 jovial, things like that. Non-physical adjectives resulting in 4,500 words. So now we're going from 18,000 to 4,500. Of what they believe to be observable traits in human beings. So the source of their behavioral traits is the dictionary, right? Then they boiled that 4,500 word list to 16 groups, 16. I, I don't know where the 16 came from, but that's what it said, okay? That 16 group wording became the first personality traits that they did. Now, in the 1960s, two researchers named Bob and Paul Costa, Bob Costa, that's cute, Paul Costa and Robert McRae from Cattell Research created a five-factor survey, which had these things, surgency, agreeableness, conscientiousness, emotional stability, and culture, okay? So we've got 16 groups, we've got a five-factor survey, and then later, this these five categories along with the 16 groups that they grouped together became were modified with the following descriptions open to experiences agreeableness conscientiousness extroversion introversion agreeableness and neuroticism is, is that clear to you <laughs> okay how about the Minnesota Multifasmic Personality Inventory, or like, or we would like to refer to as the MMPI. I know you guys have heard this one. This is all over the place. Okay. Stark Hathaway and J. Charlie McKinley, both neuroscientists. So we we've got we've got psychologists and now we've got neuroscientists now. Okay. These were different from the other assessments. The other ones that I mentioned, the big five, the EPQ, right? Those could be, could be administered by the common man, right? Not this one, no. No, 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 no. This was different from the other assessments where a trained person, so you had to be trained to administer this test, to administer this survey, okay? such as myself. <laughs> this test is used in various uses, education, employment, government positions, so on and so forth. And by the way, these tests aren't cheap, okay? They're very expensive to do, okay? And they're very expensive to score, okay? So why do I bring up all this? What is the point of this? couple of considerations here. First of all, since there are numerous personality assessments, 
These are just five of the big ones. We haven't even talked about the other ones. Okay, I could, I, I'd be here all day doing this. Since there are numerous personality assessments, which evaluation should one adopt as the standard to inform us of human personality? Should we use the MMPI? Should we use the EPQ2? There's, there's, there's a revision. Since should we use the Carl Jung? It's eight personalities. Maybe we should use Carl Jung, who has eight personalities. Maybe we should use the Myers-Briggs, which has 16. Maybe we should use the EPQ, who has two. Maybe we should use the big five, who has five. How many personalities are there? I haven't even talked about the Enneagram. We're going to get to that one. Okay? Which one should we use? Consideration number two, genetics may underscore one's tendency for a particular behavior, hence the word may. However, it may, it may not indicate a person's unique personality, but their behavior response. So I found one article where in the same article, it says genetics may play a factor, but genetics may not. Almost in the same paragraph concerning personality, of course. Notice what's missing is the immaterial. Number three, in the United States alone, there's over 2,500 personality assessments. These are just the ones that get marketed well. The ones that are backed by government funding, i.e. us. But there's 2,500 of them. How does one know which assessment, assessment observes human beings properly? I mentioned five of them. We still have 1,995 of them left to examine. And that's just in the States. We're not talking about globally, right? You can times that by 10, maybe. Consideration four. The personality assessments themselves were limited to the size, scope, and the time of their testing, which is why they have to revise them all the time. Okay? Because they are not, they may be standardized, but they're not universal. They're not transcendent. Consideration five, the participant who takes these self-assessments, or maybe the one that's trained, okay, may fail to answer questions properly due to human perception and error. What if you take this at four o'clock after you got off of work and you haven't had anything to eat? What if you take it when you first wake up in the morning? There is such a thing as test invalidity based upon human perception. Lastly, all personality assessment come from theories, theories involving human personality, not certainties, theories. Now, granted, some of them are accurate, but based upon the behavioral responses. I would, com I would submit to you that these tests do not measure a person's unique personality, but the frequency or infrequency of human behaviors, conduct and attitude in a particular environment. That's what I believe that they measure. They don't measure personality, they measure behaviors because that's what people define as personality is external behaviors. So that's what they look for, right? So why does this matter? Just breaking this down really quick here. Why does it, why is this important? I mean, Luther, why, why are you talking about this? I mean, this is, what's it have to do with anything? Because if we believe that the biblical worldview influences or impacts everything, 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 that there's, there's no direction that you can go, no place you can travel where God has not spoken about a particular subject, just the mere fact that God has created this world and reality and how it works, this should matter. 
especially when it comes to the substance and nature of human beings, and especially when we're assuming things about the nature and substance of humanity and how humanity should function and who humanity is. That's why it matters. But I have other reasons too. When a person asserts a specific theory, I know I might get pushed back for this. I'm ready for it, to be honest with you. When a person asserts a specific theory to describe human personality, that theoretical model becomes the authoritative source. It becomes the source of authority. And then to assert the scriptures are adequate to describe personality and then you and then use a theory to explain human personality is to undermine the authority of the scriptures. I love it. It's still going too. When a person completes a personality assessment, that person may be informed about their perceived personality, but these tests do not tell people how to make choices or recognize what is reality and what is not. Remember, God's word is God's word is about giving individuals wisdom on how to make right choices. If you find out that you're an expressive, guess what you're going to use to make choices? I'm expressive. This is what I am. You can't change that, right? I need to find another expressive because I'm not going to be satisfied in my marriage without one. External features become the standard by which you use to measure individuals. Well, I'm not going to hang out with them. They're an INFJ. I am an ENFJ. And you know who was an ENFJ? Will Smith. <laughs> Albert Einstein. That means I'm, I'm like Albert Einstein. No, you're not like Albert Einstein. We make these comparisons. We, become, we may become very boastful by doing that. And how would they know anyway? He never took those tests, right? Goofy. A person who completes a personality assessment may be described as having a personality that exhibits a poor behavior or attitude. Oh, I hate drivers. Drivers, they're all emotionless. All they just worry about is the objective. They don't feel like us expressives do. A person may rate or perceive personality types as being more valuable or important. Oh, I'm an analytical. It means I'm boring. I've seen people do this. So it's a it's a improper perspective. On a more extreme point, it is possible for organizations, institutions, employers, and even individual people to use these assessments to exclude opportunities based on evaluating a person and their perceived personality type. Oh, we're expressive. We don't want you. Are they honest? Can they do the job? Lastly, human personality is unique to human beings. A person with a personality, a, a, per, a, a person with a biblical perspective presupposes that the scriptures give a completely holistic view regarding the substance and nature of humanity and the qualities humanity possesses. Theorists lack the omnis of God. They're not omniscient. They're not omnipresent. They're not, uh, they're not uh, omnisapient, all, all wise. They're looking at personality from their perspective, from their outlook, from their experiences. That's a problem. Scripture gives special attention to the conduct of a person based on their identity, who they are. We are saints, therefore we ought to live like saints. Not, I am a saint, therefore I ought to be more expressive. 
or I have to be more analytical. From a biblical perspective, humankind, humankind, or human beings, analytical or expressive, they're not personality types. All human beings can be analytical or expressive based upon where they're at and what they're doing. Because God created humanity would function in the ability to exhibit themselves in this manner. It is improper to think that one is expressive and the other isn't. Everybody has this because we are all created in the image of God. And lastly, the character of a person and the wisdom to make sensible choices is more important than a perceived personality. Notice Paul doesn't write any of this stuff. Peter doesn't write any of this stuff. John doesn't write any of this stuff. He doesn't write about expressive or phlegmatic. This is who you are. This is what you believe. This is how you ought to live. He doesn't have compatibility scores for couples. I'm going to stop <laughs> because I'm out of time. I could go on, but I'm going to stop there. If you have questions, please come up to me, ask me, things like that. But I believe that, that this is a more proper understanding of personality from a biblical psychological perspective. Let's pray. Lord, when it comes to your word and the nature and substance of human beings, you've given us all the information we need to know. Some of these individuals had great intentions in wanting to examine the world around us and exclusively human beings, and that's a good thing. And we should be engaged in that. The problem is, is that these individuals, these theorists start from a God is not perspective. That's the problem. And the results of that are seen in these results, in these tests. Lord, help us to recognize that your word gives us the perspective of how to see human beings and how we ought to live and interact with each other and how we ought to see each other. Thank you again so much for who you are and for what you do for it's in your son's name. Amen.